And Elena, can we start already? Sure. You're good to start. Okay, thank you. So hi everyone, welcome to IVOM 6. This is the last session of our webinar series entitled Take a Walk at the VOM site. This, is, this webinar has been organized by the Varieties of Microbes 2020 Organizing Committee, the ISVM and Phase Directory. We started in September last year and every month we organized one hour webinars in different topics. So far, we had the pleasure to host 15 brilliant speakers, 10 distinguished chairs, and around 500, even more, participants. We are therefore grateful and happy to see the continuous engagement of the scientific community, despite this complicated period that we are all experiencing. And uh, this complicated period is forcing us again to postpone viruses of microbe. In fact, unfortunately, travel is still uncertain, and because we are so committed to have a face-to-face -face meeting and, and have you, of course, in person in Portugal, and also with the support of ISVM, we decided to postpone again VOM 2020 to July 2022. Silva, can you please uh, show the slides, the next one, so that you can see, um, no, before, the one before, Silvia. So this is just for you to see the new dates uh, of our viruses of microbes in 2022. And uh, because this year a face-to-face -face meeting is still not possible, the organizing committee of VOM and also the ISVM will continue promoting activities. And the next one is particularly dedicated to students working on viruses of microbes. And therefore, we'll be organizing a two-hour symposium in the World Microbe Forum, Forum that is organized by FEMS and ASCM in June 2024. And be aware that the deadline for abstract submission is coming, uh, is coming soon, is 18th of March. Um, and just to finalize, I'd like to say that we have prepared the questionnaire. And so it's very important to have your opinion to help us to improve our future events. And finally, on account of the need to postpone the viruses of microbes 2020, uh, we, uh, well, the, the ISVM had to reschedule the upcoming conferences. So I'm very pleased to announce that after Guimarães, we'll have Georgia in 2023 and Australia in 2024. So I'm now passing the word to Jeremy Barr to tell us a little bit more about the Australian conference and then to follow and introduce the iPhone 6. Jeremy, now it's for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. <laughs> Um, next slide, please, if you could. And good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, so my name is Jeremy Barr, and I'm really, really excited to announce that Viruses of Microbes 2024 is going to be held in Cairns, Australia. Uh, the theme for our conference is going to be expanding our viral frontiers, which references both the expansion of the VOM conference series outside of Europe for the first time, uh, and also expanding into new areas of, of viral research. Um, I just want to briefly introduce our, our local organizing committee, which is chaired by myself as conference coordinator. We also have Ruby Lynn from Westmead, Westmead Institute, Paul Jask from Macquarie University, Lucy Furfaro from University of WA, and Karen Weinberg from University of Queensland. Uh, our dates are going to be 15th to the 19th of July in 2024, uh, and the conference is hosted in Cairns, which is right on the shores of the Great Barrier Reef, one of the most amazing spots um, on the planet. Um, can't confirm this yet, but we've got some um, hopefully really unique Australian experiences for all of our VOM 2024 attendees, including potential to feed some kangaroos and even maybe hold a koala. So we really hope you can put VOM 2024 in your calendars and we look forward to hosting you um, down under in a few years. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. You can stop share screen and I will um, introduce the, the VOM series and our first speaker. So really excited to introduce uh, IVOM Series 6. Uh, so this is um, titled Bi Biotechnology Applications in Healthcare. Uh, and I just, before we kick off, I really want to remind everyone to please post any questions that you have for our speakers in the chat. We'll have a number of people um, going through the chat and then uh, we'll be asking some of these questions to our speakers um, through the chat function. So please, anything of interest, put in the chat box. And with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker who is Laurent de Babiou. Um, I've been a huge fan of Laurent's work as a, you know, in vitro experimental biologist. I'm always really amazed at the sort of work that Laurent and his team does 
and how they can apply all these things, um, you know, in, a, in an animal model in the, in the gut. Um, so excited to introduce uh, Laurent and his talk will be phages in action in the gut. So Laurent, I'll pass over to you and excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure for uh, looking to uh, this uh, IVOM series. And uh, so the talk today is about the gut and each action and inaction of the phage in the gut. So um, let me just start with uh, this pointer that will be useful here. Here we go. So you all know that uh, in, in our guts, we have uh, plenty of bacteria and also plenty of phage. And uh, uh, among the phage, the temperate are, are dominating the, uh, the virulent. But uh, actually in the, in the lab, we are interested by the virulent phage exclusively. And our question is how do actually these two populations interact with each other? So, you know, virulent phage kill bacteria. And that's pretty obvious when you look at the petri dish, when you do a, a liquid culture also, you see that the decline of the optical density and then there is uh, sometimes this event of bacteria growing. And you can look at the plate also here, you can see clones that uh, can grow in presence of uh, many phages. And that's uh, what we call the phage resistance or phage unsusceptible clones. And uh, our question was, what's going on in the vivo? And when we look at the in vivo, we are talking about the, the, the mice, uh, uh, as uh, Jamie uh, mentioned. So our first uh, setting was to use conventional mice treated with uh, antibiotics to allow E. coli to colonize the gut of this animal. And uh, we introduced the, the phage as a cocktail in the drinking water during this uh, first experiment. But what we observe in the feces is that uh, uh, the mice that uh, uh, contain E. coli or those that receive the phage, they have the same number of CFUs along the time, that three weeks period. And uh, so we are wondering the phage were doing anything at all, but then we realized that uh, when we compare the group without any E. coli, where the phage is actually quickly uh, eliminated and you don't find any more phage after a couple of uh, days, in the group of mice that is colonized and receiving the phage, you can see high number of phage in, 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 uh, in the feces. So the phage were still able to uh, amplify over time because we stopped phage after one day. So even after two weeks later, there are still some phage there, but there is no impact on the bacterial population. So uh, what's going on? That was the first question we asked at that point. And then we uh, resume that uh, the, uh, the gut itself, when we look at the feces, is actually the end point of the story. You have also the large intestine and the small intestine, and things can happen in this part of the gut before to actually examine uh, what you have in, in the feces. So in, in, in this particular case, with the same protocol, we focus on the small intestine and, and looking at the density of bacteria at 24 hour time point, we could realize that uh, indeed the phage was impacting the population of bacteria in the gut. But as soon as three days later on day four, we couldn't see any more the difference between the different groups. So uh, yes, the phage can infect the bacteria in the gut, but the impact is, is uh, kind of uh, uh, temporary and, and also uh, uh, only initial, I would say. So this uh, led us to question, you know, this coexistence of phage and bacteria over time. We, we were wondering if this could actually affect the evolution and, and, uh, of phage and, and bacteria. So we specifically addressed this question by using a set of three partners, two bacteria and one phage. The phage LF82P10, which infects the pathogenic strain LF82, but does not infect the commensal strain MG1655, and we ask whether or not, when we put all of these three guys together, the phage P10 could evolve and, and find a way to infect MG1655. We performed these experiments in three different conditions, in vitro, in dixing mice, and also in conventional mice with the antibiotics treatment, as I mentioned before. And we observed this adaptation event of uh, phage P10 able to infect uh, MG1655, only in conventional mice, not in the other conditions. We sequenced the population of phage and found that actually in this population of mice where the adaptation event was, was recorded, 
we found a mutation that was present in 100% of the uh, uh, phage genomes. And this mutation is located in a gene that is coding for a tail fiber, which uh, makes uh, perfectly sense. What we demonstrate right after is by doing a, a recombinant in E. coli, which is quite uh, easy, uh, we could show that the single mutation, single point mutation was sufficient for the phage to acquire the uh, ability of infecting MG1655, which showed that to, to which point uh, the specificity of phage and bacterial recognition can be uh, uh, in this particular uh, case. But then we were left over with the question why this single point mutation was not picked up in vitro or in dixonic mice. And then we uh, hypothesized that the conventional uh, mice environment provide a third partner, a third bacteria partner that could help the, the phage to jump from one strain to another. And indeed, from the control groups, we could uh, isolate an E. coli strain from the, from the mouse that we call a MEC1. And uh, we uh, perform experiment in vitro this time by all testing all the combination of the two strands and the combination of the three strands, asking whether or not the phage would be able to evolve and acquire the capacity to infect the strain MG1655. So after seven days of co-incubation in vitro, we couldn't detect that event, but then we continue it and day 24, we were able to actually detect the adaptation event in the population where the three uh, bacteria are present. So the consequence of this observation is that the, the diversity of microbes that is present in the gut offers multiple opportunities for the phage to adapt to these uh, different microbes. But then you also raise the question when you do experiments to control your environment and then where uh, uh, we have uh, now a problem with conventional mice is how to make sure that uh, we can reproduce and have a control environment over time. So we, we left over the, uh, 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 the conventional mice and we moved recently to a gnotoplastic mice model, which is made of axonic mice colonized by a defined population of microbes. And more specifically, we use the model that is named Oligo MM12. The mice carries 12 different strains that are all isolated from mice and uh, are representative of the uh, frequent uh, uh, strain that we have in, in the gut. The good thing about this model is that it is stable, is reproducible, it is flexible because you can add bacteria to this model and it's really available uh, through uh, the planet. There are already 40 teams using that uh, model. So we check that the E. coli can colonize the uh, model, and that's true for the commensal MT1B1 strain. It is also true for the pathogenic strain uh, uh, 5599. And then we uh, add the phage in a system. Well, we uh, actually didn't see much effect on the feces this time, neither with the uh, pathogenic. Uh, e. coli. And again, we could not detect any resistance along uh, this experiment. So that's reproduced the same uh, environment that we have before with conventional mice. When we look closer to the uh, gut segments, then we uh, actually uh, found the differences between no phage and phage. And what was surprising here is the density of the phage population in the mucosal part. And when we calculate the ratio of CFU-PFUs, then we clearly show that uh, uh, the number of phage in the uh, um, mucosal part was really uh, uh, lower than expected. So that this drives us the conclusion with uh, uh, the concept of a sourcing dynamic where close to the mucosa, you have a population of bacteria that is not actually uh, uh, affected by the presence of phage that is mostly in the lumen. And because of this system, then the, the, the bacteria resource here at the mucosal surface is not becoming resistant to the phage, despite the fact that the phage amplifies in the lumen. And now we have a more complete view of uh, the different systems that affect the phage bacteria interaction uh, in the gut, the spatial distribution, but also uh, the possibility of the uh, uh, bacteria to change their physiology. There is so the role of the host physiology is now being uh, investigated in, in, the, uh, in the lab.
So basically, uh, the gut is, I would say, a messy playground for this uh, interaction between phage and bacteria. I haven't talked about the, the prophage induction, but it is something that is very important in, in the gut for sure. And it is related to uh, the disease where people have shown from uh, metagenomic studies that indeed uh, phage dysbiosis is actually linked to uh, disease and in particular Crohn's disease here. So the challenge is for bacteria in the gut is to fear the induction of prophage. The challenge for phage is to persist. And for that, you need to adapt the host range. And, uh, and this topic of the host range, phage host range is quite uh, hot at, at the moment. A lot of people are trying to develop in silicon layer, but they have a limited resolution. And from the in vitro, a lot of things that we do in the lab uh, on a regular basis, uh, the, the, there is a lack of database, and I would say there was there was a lack of database because we published last week this uh, database of viral range where uh, each of you can actually contribute uh, the result of their experiments and uh, all together uh, characterize better the host range of phage uh, uh, and the interaction with bacteria. And with that, I will finish by thank all the people that have contributed to the uh, work and the collaborators and uh, funding resources. Thank you very much, Lohan. So let's now move to the next speaker. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to Christina Dabrowska. Uh, Christina is a professor at the Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Rocklow. And uh, Christine is an expert in phage pharmacokinetics and effects of, um, on mammalian cells. And she has been developing pioneering studies in the immune response to bacteriophages. Christina will uh, talk about uh, a study that went wrong. This is quite interesting about uh, uh, phage engineering and phage pharmacokinetics. So I, I'm really very curious to hear what you have to tell us, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I'm very happy I could join. I must say I really miss phage community, so it's really great that we can meet at least remotely. Uh, and today, yes, I would like to talk about a study that went wrong, uh, which is, one second, yeah, which is closely related to phage pharmacokinetics. And today I would like to focus on how phage engineering may cooperate or in the opposite, do not cooperate with what we know uh, about phage um, uh, pharmacokinetics. So probably the major aspect that is uh, well known and related to phage pharmacokinetics is the phenomenon of long circulating phages. They were discovered pretty much time ago. It was 1996 when they were for the first time reported. And basically this is a specific phenotype that uh, relates to how phage survives in vivo. When we look to uh, circulation, to phage concentration in blood, here is the concentration, we will find out that long circulating mutants, they achieve much higher concentration and they keep this high concentration much longer than wild type phage does. And this is uh, what was for the first time um, proposed that this results from differences how this phage is entrapped by reticuloendothelial system. Currently, this is mononuclear phagocytic system. This is a very important um, phenomenon because it translates to phage ability to clear infections in vivo. When we look to how this phage behaves in case, in case when it's used to treat uh, an infection, you may see that here are disease symptoms. So the more, the worse. Wild type phage is not very effective. And in a marine model, it really ended up with little effects of the infection and these animals were not saved by the wild type phage. But in the contrary, long circulating mutants were very effective in clearing the infection. So 
not all infections are systemic and it brings us to the idea that maybe it's very useful to target a specific site of infection that may um, that we may observe in a particular case. Of course, when we use the same amount of phage that will be distributed in the whole system, we will get much less phages in the site of infection. Then when we have a targeted phages and they can accumulate in this infection site. How to do that? Of course, the first technology that may come into mind is phage display because it allows us to present on the phage surface some foreign elements and this includes peptides that may address specific tissues or cells that we would like to have uh, targeted by the phage. And this is what we uh, proposed in this particular study, we selected seven targeting sequences, all previously reported by many authors who investigate this problem, how to target a phage. It's usually uh, a diff very different purpose than, uh, than uh, clearing infections, but the idea was that maybe it's going to work the same. So. We used phages targeting lungs, brain, prostate, and facilitating translocation from gut lumen to circulation. And how it worked. Here in blue, you have phage concentration, well, wild type phage concentrations in particular organs or tissues. And here are the variants. So when you have a look at lung and prostate, no, no significant differences. But when we look what happened to brain and to translocation, we have less phage in case of engineered variants than in case of wild type phage. So definitely the study went wrong. So we tried to find out what happened there. And then we looked how this phage was circulating in the whole system after injection to the, to the circulation, just to see that maybe something precludes the phage activity and accumulation in, um, the, in the selected tissues. And here it was absolutely the same. Again, less variants targeting brain or variants dedicated to better translocation than in case of wild type phage. Okay, so it was the systemic problem and it tells us that our variants demonstrated short circulating phenotype. Again, what happened there? So the first idea was maybe they were very effectively trapped by the reticular endothelial system. So the major traps are liver, and spleen, and we compared tissue concentrations of all phages in the spleen and liver, and we found out the same. Again, less variants than wild type phage. So what else could neutralize the phage? This could be, in theory, specific antibodies or phagocytosis because they are well known as inactivating uh, phages. So we started to test how about antibodies and how about phage immunogenicity, even though I must say we doubt it could be really engaged because it takes time to develop specific antibodies. But to make sure we just compared how about induction of this uh, two classes. And as you see, here is wild type phage. Here are the variants. No significant differences in IgM. And in IgG, T4 was even a little bit more immunogenic than the variants. So nothing about antibodies. And then phagocyting cells, we tested two fractions. We incubated phage with isolated cells and we compared phage titers after this incubation. Here we have the wild type phage and here 
the variance. As you see, no significant differences. So this was not phagocytosis that decided on the short circulating phenotype. What else? We also wanted to see how it works with complement system. The complement system is a cascade that is very effective in neutralizing pathogens and it helps other elements of the immune system. It is pretty complex, in fact, but it is easy to investigate in a knockout mice model, uh, mice with defective complement cascade. For example, they may have destroyed C3 element and then we lose all other elements and the whole pathway is stopped and it's not possible to destroy its target. How it works with phages? When we see how phage circulates in complement deficient mice, these are black bars, and we compare to normal mice, we see that after 10 hours, after 15 hours, we have much more active phage in the complement deficient mice. So definitely it's possible that it contributes to phage, uh, phage removal from the system. So let's have a look what happens ex vivo when we investigate our particular mutant, mutants, engineered phages, and we compare to the wild type phage. We just exposed the phages to sera, and this serum was either inactivated complement serum or active complement serum. And as you see, complement system was very effective in neutralization of phages, decreasing phage titers, but it was more effective in case of variants and less effective in case of wild type phage. So the most probably this was the complement system that was responsible for short circulating phenotype of this variants that were more sensitive to the complement system action than the wild type phage was. And now a very short look on proposed mechanism, what probably happened there. So we already know that complement system may somehow uh, be regulated by, surf by exposure of specific amino acid on the surface. And this is lysine arginine. And when we look to our mutants, we see that the worst var variants, the shortest phenotypes, shortest circulating phenotypes were those without arginine. So the most probably pharmacokinetics could be designed by designing amino acidic composition of capsids. To conclude, first phages are probably optimized to circulate in mammalian bodies because mammalian bodies are natural environments for phages. And this optimized, optimized balance can be destroyed when we uh, try to modify phage and to engineer the phage surface. And then the idea is that phage variants design should include phage pharmacokinetic aspects Otherwise, this study may go wrong. I would like to acknowledge my team who spent hard time solving this problem and thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was a really, really interesting talk, some exciting data. Um, so thank you for sharing. Uh, so we'll introduce our next speaker, who's going to be Tristan Ferry, and he's going to tell us about his phage therapy experience in France, um, particularly looking at bone and joint infections. So um, Tristan, um, look forward to your talk and I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to, to do this talk. So uh, my name is Tristan Ferry, I'm an infectious disease physician in the Lyon University Hospital. And uh, I am the coordinator of a regional re referral center for the management of complex bone and joint infection. 
So everybody here know what is a, a bacteriophage. And uh, uh, the primary goal for a physician is finally to, to have purified uh, phages uh, to use in the clinic. And uh, uh, there are some public structure uh, in Europe, such as uh, Queen Astrid Military Hospital, uh, who has the ability to, to do that. But uh, this is a project of uh, a lot of uh, different companies in Europe, but also in the US and elsewhere. Uh, to finally uh, um, uh, purify some uh, phages that could be used in clinical trial and in clinical practice. In fact, in, in fact the most difficult to reach goal uh, if to, uh, is to have phages and to demonstrate that the phage are useful uh, in clinical practice for uh, curing uh, a patient. And we have different bacterial disease with uh, different complexity uh, with the prognosis factors that could also influence the outcome, such as the host comorbidity, the local conditions, if the patient is also treated with antibiotics, if it is a biofilm uh, associated disease. And to do clinical trials, uh, we have to do that to demonstrate the efficacy in each indication. And to do a clinical trial, it's costly and take time. So it's not uh, easy. And in fact, uh, um, what are the relevant indications of phage uh, therapy? Because for me, there are some indications that are not relevant. So this is different kind of bone and joint infection, very heterogeneous disease. Uh, all of them need uh, surgery and uh, antibiotics. And I will show you that some of them are not good uh, candidates for phage uh, therapy. So I'm the coordinator of a network in France that is dedicated to the management of patients with complex bone and joint infection. This is the implementation of the network has been done 10 years ago by the, by the French Health Ministry. So Lyon is here in the southeast of uh, France. And we have a dedicated activity uh, to bone and joint infection with uh, surgeons, infectiologists and microbiologists. The aim is to manage the patient in a multidisciplinary way, multidisciplinary management of the, of the patient. And we also have uh, some uh, uh, topic on the research, especially in the lab with Frédéric Laurent, to better understand the pathophysiology of bone and joint infection. And my main uh, research program is to promote the innovative treatments in such patients, especially medical innovations to maintain the function in patients with prosthetic joint infections for whom uh, explantation uh, of the prosthesis is not feasible. So to promote conservative approaches. So this is a living place of all the patients are, that are managed in our center. As you can see, most of them are, are living uh, uh, so far from, uh, from Lyon. And the setup of this uh, expertise leads to uh, uh, increase of the recruitment of the patient in all center. So more and more patient, more and more complex, and more and more project uh, to uh, find solution for this patient. So I have three uh, clinical cases. This is uh, the first case of a patient with trauma open fracture as a past history. The patient has uh, osteomyelitis due to staphorus. Uh, he uh, had uh, a surgical debridement, antibiotics, he experienced a failure uh, 10 years ago, and so he decided to, to, go in, to, to go in Georgia to uh, receive phages locally, but also orally, uh, 10 years ago. And the, the patient is coming back to my clinic with a clinical failure. Uh, this is uh, the sclerotic bone uh, of the patient in the, in the tibia, and as you can see, we can see the the bone uh, uh, here, there is a partial uh, bone necrosis uh, that's requiring surgery. The skin and soft tissue uh, uh, is damaged and it's required a surgical coverage. And you know uh, that phages are fantastic, but they have a biological limit. It's impossible for them to perform bone debridement to regenerate uh, skin and soft tissue. And uh, uh, we can uh, heard uh, about uh, Regar, he was a, a surgeon uh, he used uh, the phages of Felix Derrell in Paris, and uh, this is what he wrote in 1961. The phage uh, will be able to do nothing against the dead bone deprived of circulation. This bone will become sequestered, and the lesion is no longer of matter of surgery. That's why uh, osteomyelitis is not, for me, uh, a good indication of phage therapy. This is a second case of a prosthetic joint infection. 
a patient with a staphorus prosthetic joint infection of the knee. The patient previously have a conservative approach with surgery, uh, prolonged antibiotics, and the patient has a failure uh, with uh, septic arthritis, impossible for him to work, very painful knee uh, with a purulent discharge. Uh, so uh, in France, as you know, uh, a company has developed a clinical trial, the Fagobond trial, and we try to work with this company uh, because it uh, opens the door uh, for uh, uh, compassionate treatment. And this patient was treated with uh, dedicated uh, phages. Uh, uh, um, we are doing a phagogram, select, uh, select uh, some uh, active phages, uh, prepare it with uh, uh, or pharmacy. Uh, and as you can see, uh, direct uh, injection of active phages during uh, uh, surgery. Uh, and uh, uh, the patient uh, is going uh, uh, well uh, two years after that. We have an another uh, example of a spinal implant infection, patient infected with a multidrug resistant pathogen that uh, uh, was also resistant to phages. And we developed a, a dedicated approach uh, with uh, uh, academic phages that has been purified uh, in, uh, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, uh, dedicated phages has been found in Switzerland and then purified uh, in, uh, in uh, Belgium to treat uh, uh, the patients. And uh, uh, the patient was uh, uh, treated uh, uh, thanks to this academic collaborative research with a nice uh, clinical uh, situation. Uh, so chronic prostate joint infection is a good indication and potentially spinal abscess uh, also. Uh, we have some uh, uh, derivative approach uh, with arthroscopic uh, DARE. Uh, we also have the uh, derivative approaches with uh, ultrasound guided uh, injection. It's not yet uh, uh, published. And we also treated some patients with uh, particular hydrogel to facilitate the application of uh, uh, phages. We also have some experience of intravenous uh, injections for patients with uh, uh, endocarditis. We published some uh, uh, of these uh, cases. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we posted, uh, we are posting uh, all uh, new patients and we have uh, 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 two projects that uh, is found out now. And the project is to have academic phages uh, in the next uh, five years. So I think there is a real place for phage uh, therapy to maximize the clinical uh, success in complex uh, bacterial infection. Uh, the uh, expertise of referral clinical centers is very important. We treated 21 patients and it's very important to have academic collaborations with uh, the health authority and also with the industry. And the project is uh, to have a national phase therapy center in France to perform clinical trial to demonstrate a potential benefit uh, of phage therapy in such uh, patients. So uh, I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues uh, in Lyon. Uh, you can uh, uh, check also our website and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tristan. It was a really, really exciting talk to see all the, all the progress in the clinical space with that. So that concludes our three talks with some um, three amazing speakers. Uh, and I'm gonna chair the first round of questions uh, for Laurent's talk. So I've got a few questions here for Laurent uh, from the audience. So the first one I'll kick off. Um, did you find the same mutation in vitro which made the MG1655 strain sensitive to phage P10 um, as in vivo? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by, I'm, I'm not sure we, we performed the experiment that is asked for, we, Found from the in vivo data, the point yeah. mutation, and then we constructed a recombinant phage that has that point mutation. So in vitro, when we tested, then it was sufficient to provide the uh, uh, Osrange to extension to uh, infect MG1655. We did not ever find that mutation from pure in vitro system. Cool. Excellent, that was the question, so thank you. Um, when, when your phages were host range adapted, um, did you see any increase in persistence in the gut in the absence of the bacterial host? So to, I guess to put that question another way, did you find any adaptations in the phages that increased their persistence in the gut in general? No, actually we didn't 
put back the phage in the system and look if they BF differentially. So uh, that's something we we probably plan to do, but we haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a great, great question, more sort of broad thinking about the methodology. So how do you think we can advance this gut microbiome research using more in vitro models, um, especially considering that you know, mucosal bacteria behave very differently to three different, one, different ones um, and, you know, the accessibility of some of these in vivo systems. Well, you know, all, you know there's this famous sentence that uh, all models are wrong, but uh, some are useful. So depending on the question you're asking, then you have to find the best model for your question. That's, that would be the, the easy answer. I, I don't have a specific recommendation to say that one model would be better than another. It's, it's purely on, on the question you want to ask. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this one's maybe a little bit close to my heart. Uh, did you, you know, have any phages that with highlighted affinity to mucosal components? And have you considered whether or not these may help target some of these bacteria or um, influence some of the results you showed? We, on, on the few occasions, we uh, actually give um, phage to mice and try to find if they could actually uh, reside for a long time in, in the gut, over you know, three, four days. We, we haven't found this type of phage in our hands. So yeah. after three, four days, we, we cannot find any more this phage. So they do not seem to bind very efficiently for a long time in, in the mucosa. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe one final question for you. So the bacteria colonizing the mu mucosa, um, did you look at their resistance mechanisms and how they became, whether or not they became resistant to those phages and, and what that mechanism was? So we are looking for uh, bacteria that develop resistance to phage. We've been looking for thousands of clones. We never found a single one. Right. So uh, a hypothesis, when we sequence a couple of clones, we could see that there are mutations that suggest that must have been resistant at some point, but when we test them, they are not. So we suspect that uh, the bacteria that become resistant are not the best fit in the gut. And so there is a, such a cost on the fitness that they are, they are lost basically. And yeah. we, we cannot pick them. But of course, when you say that you pick up, you know, a thousand or few thousands, there are still millions out there. So there are still possibility that we just miss them so, so far. Awesome. Thank you, Laurent, that was great. Um, I'll pass over to you, you, Joanna. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Laura. So we have a few questions to Christina, very nice talk. And um, so here, uh, I, I think that some of them you have already replied. I have here one of David Harper is asking if given that, that the primary action of the complement is the formation of the membrane attack complex, how do you see complement working against phage? Yes, thank you for this question because I think it's the central question in, in, in this case. So uh, of course we are not 100% sure. So it's more what we conclude for, from results from experiments that we were able to to, to complete so far. But what we think it's not a simple way of action, it's rather that first it depends on phage and it looks like some phages were pretty sensitive to be somehow um, destabilized. Uh, I mean, the structure of phage particle because the um, complement system, it uh, uses a covalent bond and it is a strong interaction. So probably to some extent, it is possible that it um, destroys just uh, the particle, even if not completely. It has its effect on the ability of phage um, to infect. But in vivo, it's much more complex because when only we have this interaction of a complement system with any target, this target becomes much more visible to all other elements of the immune system. And it of course re um, relates also to immunological cells, to, to all cells that are capable to engulf external objects. And I, 
uh, I want to say that this means that phage will be cleared by the cells much more efficiently when it interacts with uh, the complement system, even if it survives the interaction itself. Okay, Christina, thank you very much. There is also here one question just to clarify, uh, Joseph, Michael Joseph. He asks uh, what between, uh, in summary, between engineer and wild phages, which one is more sensitive to complement proteins? You've said that in the talk, but maybe you can uh, make it more clear yeah. now. <laughs> of course. So funny enough, our more sensitive were the engineered phages. We wanted to make better phages, we did worse phages. So this is how the study went wrong. Uh, also, we had some neutral modifications. These were the gray bars in my presentation. So it was not that uh, perfect idea when we tried to see how it worked. So basically, uh, we couldn't get really accumulation of NFH, but uh, still the wild type phage was the better one. Okay, one last question, Christina, because it makes clear that wild type phage, they are naturally living with us, so they are long circulating uh, uh, phages. So what would be the advice if we would like to modify a phage and make it even more uh, long circulating? Would, is there any um, idea of how to, to go into that direction? So from what we know so far, uh, there are some other author's observations what could uh, decrease somehow the sensitivity of phage to being activated by complement system. And to summarize, this was the presence of arginine and uh, lysine, uh, specific amino acids. So it suggests that, we, that phages uh, that contain these elements on their system, they would do better in vivo than without. So this is the major thought. But I think that it still requires a lot of studies and I wouldn't say anything very strong here because maybe other researchers will find out some very interesting uh, indications how to design the new type of phage, the engineered phage to get this result that this pharmacokinetics is beneficial, not worse. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. It was really very interesting. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I have also some questions now to Tristan. Um, very nice talk. Surprising to see uh, how the patients uh, could be have a very good effect on, on phage therapy. Uh, so I have here, uh, first question is from Yvonne. Yvonne wants to ask, how did you overcome the lack of regulatory guidelines for phage application in humans? Yes, very important question. Uh, we have a, uh, we are so lucky in France because we, we have the, the history of uh, Felix Derrel and Pasteur Institute. We have some biologists and microbiologists such as Laurent, uh, such as Alain Dublanchet, who works in uh, uh, 10 years above phage uh, in the lab. And we are also have um, clinicians with a reference uh, center for the management of complex infection. And I, I think it's very uh, a key element because we can validate that some patients are in the dead end, dead end situation and all the patients are in the dead end situation. And we have to, to, to do that with a multidisciplinary meeting uh, to say that definitely there is no other option. Finally, we have a company uh, in France. It's not uh, uh, the case in all European country because we have a company that uh, has the ability to purify uh, phages uh, um, in a uh, accordance with the French Health uh, 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 Agency. Uh, and finally, this company has done a clinical trial uh, in burn patients. But it's very important to start uh, a clinical trial, even if it is it, an, in another indication, it uh, clearly opens the door uh, for a compassionate uh, use. So we are lucky because we have all of that uh, uh, in France and under the umbrella uh, of the Helsinki Declaration, you know that uh, if you have a particular patient in a dead end situation and if uh, 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 the patient did not respond to usual treatment, you can propose uh, some treatments that uh, uh, has, have not demonstrated to be efficient. And uh, we also use uh, all the work 
that we are doing in the lab to demonstrate the, the activity of phages in biofilm to convince uh, our authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for, for that comment. So uh, Ian Zhang wants to know how, if you could comment how Fagopied is coming along. Okay, Fagopied, it's like a Fago foot. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, clinical trials uh, that uh, will start in France this year, we, we hope, with uh, um, uh, phages that uh, are targeting Staphylococcus in patients with di diabetic foot infection. So I'm not a principal investigator. Uh, it is uh, Professor Soto uh, in the city of Nîmes. Uh, we hope it will start this year. Mm, great. So another and the final question. So uh, how do you deal or how do you think it can be deal with the difficulties? And you mentioned that, that there are some biological limitations of phages. And the one is related to resistance, and the other one is that the complex environment also involving biofilms. So, it's there are any um, specific secrets of how to deal with these uh, two difficulties that phages have? There's no dedicated uh, secrets, but it's uh, important also to, to demonstrate that the phages could have an activity. Uh, in a biofilm, uh, especially a synergistic activity with antibiotics into biofilm, uh, because uh, in the real life, uh, this patient has a huge uh, biofilm. Uh, and it's very important to, to use that also to convince uh, health authority. And uh, after that, uh, we have to select uh, the best patient candidate to receive phage, not so so easy uh, because uh, as uh, the, the strain is in biofilm, uh, uh, it could uh, be uh, very difficult to treat with a relapse. Uh, so uh, phages are not a magic bullet. We can have some uh, uh, relapse also, acquisition of phage resistance, but uh, 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 we always use antibiotics with phages for this patient. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much, because you are addressing a question asked by Ergun. Uh, he wants to know uh, if you are combining antibiotics. Yes, and, uh, as a patient yeah. are in a dead end situation, most yes. of patients previously have surgery and antibiotics, uh, they experience failure, and that we are doing the same thing, surgery, antibiotics, and we add uh, phages, and we catch some uh, good outcome. That's why we think that phages help. In this, in this patient. Yeah, it makes sense. There's also a very interesting question from Valeria. She's suggesting why uh, you are not isolating phages directly from uh, wounds and, and diseased patients instead of going to effluent waters and sewage, and sewage uh, to pick up phages. Yes, the phage discovery is very interesting. Uh, I think uh, uh, phages are everywhere. Uh, in uh, in uh, sewage uh, waste, but also maybe in the skin of patient, and especially maybe phages that uh, target uh, staph epi, staph epidermidis, because there are a few phages that uh, uh, target staph epi in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, the environment. But maybe uh, they are uh, uh, in the uh, body surface of the patient, so it could be an option to 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 see there also. Okay, Tristan, thank you very much. Thank you so and much. Thank you also for the audience for these such nice uh, questions. I will now pass the word to Madalena that will close this session. Uh, well, we are now close to end this webinar series. We had six, six webinars. This is the last one. And uh, we are closing uh, with another great session. So thank you to all the speakers, Laura, Christina, and Tristan, and of, of course to the chairs, Jeremy and Joanna for guiding uh, this, uh, the discussion. And of course to, the, uh, to our audience and for, for participating and contributing to the discussion. Uh, to, today we had more than 200 participants, which is uh, really very nice. Uh, just let me remind you that all sessions uh, have, been, have been recorded and uh, are available at uh, our your, uh, YouTube channel. Now, because this is the last uh, session from this series, uh, this high VOM series that we titled Take a Walk on the VOM site, we challenge our most frequent participants 
uh, in this uh, in this webinars to participate in a in an image contest. So the idea was to stimulate your creativity uh, and create an image that could reflect some, somehow uh, your experience in this uh, this series of webinars um, and uh, your expectations also for the next virus of micro microbes that you know now. Uh, will be will take place in Portugal in 2022. Uh, so thank you to all uh, to all of you that participated and submitted uh, an image. We have selected uh, three images from the ones we have received, and based on the creativity on the image and the message that was transmitted through that image to the virus of microbes community. We, uh, the local organizing committee, voted for the winner. So uh, I ask now Silvio to show us uh, these three selected presentations and the winner. Okay, so thank you, Carlos. Uh, congratulations. I, I know that you were there. You can, can you, you are watching us. Can you just turn on? Congratulations. Just please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. So, congratulations. For... And also to the other participants, as you can, could see, uh, we had the wonderful uh, images and uh, the, yeah. ones, the ones you have submitted were, were really, really creative. And you oh, know that you. we are you are awarded with um, a free uh, registration to the, for the virus of microbes in oh, Portugal. Thank and you so you, much. And then all of us will see your image in our abstract book. Uh, oh, uh, I wonder if you are, want to say some words. If you, of course, I believe that you are more more than happy to to have this uh, award. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so very happy. Well, in, in Mexico is five I am, but I'm uh, I'm asleep. But uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I try to give an image that reflect the our situation and our future uh, desires. The, we want to uh, meet each other uh, again in, in in person, and that was the the main idea of my of my picture so thank you so much for for choosing me and thank you for for the opportunity and and thank you uh the other participants with uh, amazing tamir uh, also uh, okay Carl. <laughs> i'm so happy and <laughs> okay <laughs> thank, thank you, you so Carlos. much I'm, I'm then you get uh, instructions yeah. from, from us how to receive your award okay uh and now okay thank you so much thank you uh, finally, and of course, before closing, uh, Joana and I will, would like to make a special thank uh, to all members of the IVOM Organizing Committee 
Uh, and please, uh, I ask you to put the slide on the screen. So thank you, Carlos, Priscila, Jessica, Jan, Anna, Hugo, uh, Yvonne, Luis, and Silvio. Thank you so much. You have been really great. Without your commitment, this is not possible. So really, uh, thank you. Uh, we thank you so much, me and Joanna. We are very happy to have you with us. And now, goodbye to all. And we hope to see you in person in Portugal in 2022 for a great Virus of Microbes meeting that we expect. So bye-bye to all. Joanna, I don't know if you want to say goodbye also. Yeah, goodbye. Hope to see you soon. Okay, bye-bye. See you.